Welcome to Project Access webinar on studying law. So for those of you who are not familiar with Project Access, we're a non-profit organization that believes in fair access to top universities. And that's why we've conducted these weekly webinars as well as organized and launched a completely free mentorship program for our students from less privileged backgrounds to help them gain admissions into top universities all around the world. So the subject of today's webinar obviously on the slide today, is about law. So today I'm joined with panelists Sean, as well as Siva, and my name is Joseph, and the three of us will be your panelists for today. So the scope of today's uh, webinar, which Sean will shed a little bit light on later, will be on what studying law is like in the UK, what its application process is like, and also a little bit of insights onto its careers and opportunities. If you have any questions at any point of time, please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So at the bottom of your Zoom menu, you should see a Q&A button. You can submit your questions to us through that function and we'll respond to, that, to them after the presentation is over. So for the next one hour or so, we'll be presenting for about 30 to 35 minutes, followed by a 25 minute Q&A. With that, I'll hand my time over to Sean. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everyone. So um, these are the contents of um, today's webinar, as uh, Joseph already mentioned. So um, first, we'll start with the goal of this webinar. Um, so we have three main goals today. Uh, first is to answer the question, is law for you? So we'll be talking about what exactly the study of law um, is about, what you can expect, what kind of topics and what kind of questions you'll be asked and uh, the job prospects, um, where to study these courses. So this webinar will focus mainly on the UK, but we will touch on the difference uh, in jurisdictions between the US, the UK, uh, and the civil law system. And um, yeah, we'll answer your, any questions that you might have uh, at the end of the presentation. So um, a short introduction uh, as to who your panelists are tonight. Um, so my name is Sean. I'm from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I'm currently studying law at the University of Oxford. So I just finished my first year. Um, my legal interests mainly are in corporate law, but uh, as, I'm only, I've, as I've only just finished my first year, I'm still exploring. Some internships I've done um, in Malaysia are such as Green, uh, Wong & Partners, some Malaysian, local Malaysian firms, and in the UK, I was successful in um, applying to some first year schemes with a and and Hogan Lovells. So my current role in Project Access is um, with, I'm a recruitment officer. So I look for mentors um, in Oxford, any current students who want to help any prospective students like yourselves. And um, yeah, just some of my interests. So um, Siva, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, yes, so as I already mentioned, I'm Siva. Um, I study business law in Vienna, which is um, quite different than um, our other two panelists today. Um, I'm in my third year now. I did my exchange um, last the last two terms in Warwick uh, in the UK. And um, my legal interests are especially in civil law, um, concretely corporate law as well. Um, I've done internships at the OPEC Fund and um, a few um, like Austrian um, um, business firms, but um, especially to law, I think is interesting the DLA Piper Spring program, um, although due to COVID, it's been unfortunately um, postponed. Uh, my role in Project Access is um, that I'm the project management officer um, for the our Austria team. Um, and yeah, then some of my interests you can see um, down are like, playing the piano or diving, fencing. Um, but with law, obviously, you don't always have a lot of time to pursue your hobbies and interests. <laughs> so I'll hand over to um, Joseph. Yep. So I'm Joseph. I come from Singapore, pretty close by to where Sean is now. And similar to him as well, I will be matriculating into the University of Oxford to study law later this year. So my legal interests currently lie in corporate and commercial law but I'm very excited to learn more about what the law holds when I actually enter school to study it. I've done a few legal as well as non-legal internships, both 
in the realms of mergers and acquisitions, litigation, as well as internships with venture capital and Singapore's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Currently in Project Access, I'm a team member of Project Access Singapore, where we help to organize events and really push the Project Access mission in Singapore. My interests are my two beautiful cats. I love reading, and I also come from a background of modern web. So that's all for me. Thanks, Joseph. Um, so we'll go right ahead into talking about what does it mean to study law and what exactly you can expect um, in studying a law degree because um, most people wouldn't have had studied law um, before university. So I think this is one of the main questions that people have. So what exactly is law? So law is a social science that investigates the relationship and rules that govern personal, social, and economic, uh, economic and political relationships. And it's so important because it lies at the heart of any society that expects to function efficiently. Law permeates every sector of society, which is also another reason why it's so interesting to study. So what you can expect from studying a law degree is not simply just memorizing the black letter of law, it's not, not simply memorizing the statutes, but most of the time it will involve questioning if whether the law that exists currently is satisfactory and whether reform is required. And that will involve um, looking at the different interests of different stakeholders and balancing different policy arguments. So what you will find that you'll be doing a lot is that you'll be, uh, as expected, doing a lot of reading. And um, you can expect to do a lot of reading, not only of just the case law, but also of arguments that academics have made debating whether reform of the law is necessary. So why study law? Um, the law? Studying law gives you a lot of transferable skills that are applicable in any career path that you may want to choose. So it trains your critical thinking and the ability to communicate reason arguments. And that is vital in anything you, that um, you might want to pursue in the future. So, um, it's important for us to here distinguish between the many different legal systems uh, in the world. So we have the common law and the civil law. This is one of the main distinctions. Uh, the common law is found in countries like the UK and the US and other Commonwealth countries such as Malaysia and Singapore. And the civil law system is found um, generally in uh, Europe. So what is the main difference is that um, in common law, there is a large focus on judicial precedent. And what that means is that um, judges will decide on um, any statutes or cases that are brought before them, and that would be treated as a legal source as well. Um, Siva, could you maybe speak about how, what, how that differs in um, civil law? Yes, yeah, so um, sure, thank you, Sean. Um, so as you can see on the slides, like um, a lot of, I think the most, um, most prominent difference is that in, in the case law system, you refer to old cases, while in civil law, you usually have statutes that have already been written down and that are set. And it doesn't matter if a judge has judged something differently in a time before, what matters is the statute and how you can apply that to the current case. So I think this is one of the major um, differences. And um, yeah, also the role of a lawyer is very different because you don't um, have to, you don't always have to um, persuade the judge or make them, make them like argue that have the best arguments, uh, but it's rather about applying the statutes that you, that you, um, that, are, that are written and that are fixed basically. Um, so to sum up, uh, civil law is mainly based on the law in front of you, but in the common law, there's space to argue and pursue and there's uh, persuade and there's a lot of space of, for interpretation. Um, and a note about the difference between the US and the UK is that studying law in the US 
um, is a postgrad degree, whereas in the UK it would be an undergrad degree. So you'd finish studying law within three years, um, whereas in the US you need to do first year four years of undergrad and then um, I think it's three years of postgrad <laughs> law. Um, so what is studying law in the UK like? So as we've already mentioned, uh, the UK has a common law system and what is the distinguishing feature of that is um, the reliance on judicial precedent. But what is unique, um, quite unique to the UK is that we don't have a written constitution. So what you would generally imagine constitution of a country to be is like the US constitution, whereas there's like a single document um, or a single piece of law that states like all the rights, for example. But in the UK, the constitution is made up of case law, of statutes, of constitutional conventions. So, uh, and that, that's what makes studying law in the UK um, very interesting. So these are some examples of statutes that I studied in my first year. So uh, the Human Rights Act, 1998, the Sexual Offences Act, 2003, the Consumer Rights Act, 2015. And uh, you can see some example of some cases that we do. So, uh, and as I mentioned before, in your law degree, what you'll be doing is questioning whether these statutes are clear, whether they should be changed, whether they were drafted wrongly, um, and critically thinking about issues like that. So these are some of the uh, examples of questions uh, that I had in um, my time studying law. So uh, one of the topics is constitutional law. Uh, so does the Human Rights Act 1998 give the courts too much say on political issues? So this is a classic, um, a classic essay question that you might have to do. So as I mentioned before, you would have to balance the different policy arguments. Um, you'll have to see how it would affect the different um, stakeholders that might be affected by the Human Rights Act uh, in crafting your essay. And um, the criminal law question is an example of a problem question that you might do. So this requires you to apply the statutes and the, the black letter law, um, which is different from the essay question, which is more opinion-based and arguing for reform. I'm not gonna read out the whole question, but if you want to have a look at it, you can check it out on, our, on the YouTube um, page after this has been posted. So some myth busters, uh, firstly, it's, uh, if you want to work as a lawyer in the UK, you have to study a law degree. So that's not true at all. Um, studying law is very, very different from working as a lawyer. Even after you complete your study of law in the UK, you still have to go on to do a training um, program. So um, this will differ if you want to become a barrister or solicitor, and we'll touch on what the difference of that is a bit later. But um, if you want to work as a lawyer, but you're still passionate about studying, pursuing studies in, for example, history or um, biochemistry uh, at university, you can still become a lawyer if you take um, a conversion course or the training program to achieve the training qualification. And um, law firms, are quite open, are very open actually to students who have studied a different degree uh, other than law. And there are a lot of opportunities, as many opportunities um, to work in law, even if you'd studied a non-law degree uh, as if you had. So next, you have to study law at A levels to study a law degree. Um, that's again, not true. There, you are at no disadvantage if you have not studied law at A levels. Most people haven't studied law A levels. Um, when you start university, you'll be taught everything from scratch. So that shouldn't be something, something to worry about. And um, finally, it's all work and no play. So um, to be frank, a law degree is a lot of work, but um, I think most people still find time to unwind and um, party. I think lawyers are one of the hardest partiers out there because they have so much work and so much stress. So 
I think you should definitely keep in mind though that it can be quite intense and uh, whether you're just prepared to put in work that's necessary because you'll definitely find time to relax and have fun. So spotlight on studying law at Oxford. So this is, I'll talk about my first year of studying law at Oxford and how the course is split up and the workload that you can expect. So law at um, Oxford is quite different to any other university in the way it's split up because you don't have exams at the end of every um, academic year. Instead, you have what is called moderations, law moderations, which take place at the end of your second term. And you will be tested on three modules, constitutional law, criminal law, and Roman law. And then your next exam will only take place at the end of your degree, which uh, will be at the end of your third year. And there will be nine papers that will be examined. So this is uh, definitely something you should keep in mind when choosing, for example, between Oxford or Cambridge or Oxford and any other university is that um, Cambridge, they have exams at the end of every year. So if you are, you think that that might be more a safer bet, then that's something that you should consider. So at the bottom, you can see what a typical week in first year is like. So this is kind of as, as bad as it gets. Um, it's no secret that any degree at Oxford is, is a lot of work. Um, Oxford, um, in, in law, we operate on kind of a bi-weekly schedule. So usually you'd have three tutorials spread across two weeks. Um, so this is an example of a week where you'd have two tutorials. So usually a tutorial is, um, for those of you who don't know what a tutorial is, is basically um, a small group teaching with your tutor. There will be three, um, two to three other students and you will engage deeply in the material uh, for that week. And these usually last about an hour. And for those tutorials, what you'll be expected to do is you'll be expected to write an essay. Um, and for the essay, you will have a reading list. And this reading list, um, it is recommended by the Oxford Law Faculty that it sh should be about 30 hours of work um, per weekly reading list. But this will really vary per person if you really put in all the hard work and read all the cases and um, really read all the articles, it will, you will find yourself doing maybe even more than 30 hours of work. But um, not everyone has the time. So I would say that on average, people would spend, could spend between 10, at, at least 10 hours um, of reading and writing the essay. Um, 30 hours would be kind of on the high end. And then lectures are typically optional in Oxford. Most law students, I would say about half of law students go for lectures, go for their lectures. Um, and the main reason for this is because it doesn't synchronize with our tutorials. So you could, there could be lectures on something that you wouldn't have an essay on. Um, so, if you are a really hardworking student, you would have that extra, potentially six hours of lectures um, each week. So at the most, you'd be probably looking at um, about 38 hours of work a week. Oh, um, yeah, but this will vary on week because some weeks you'll only have one essay and it'll depend on how much work that you want to put in. So I'll hand over to Siva to talk about joint order degrees. Yeah.
Thank you, Sean. So um, as I already mentioned, I study business law, um, which is why I'm gonna um, talk about that for a bit. Maybe some of you are interested in doing uh, law combined with something else, so I chose business. Um, can you go over to the next slide, Sean? Thank you. Um, so I'm not gonna go into as much detail as Sean did because as I assume um, that most of you are applying for UK universities, it's probably very different um, from you know lectures and seminars and that these kind of things. But I think what is quite interesting to see is how um, they split the business modules and the law modules within throughout these years. So for me, it's a three year um, degree, but as I did a, an exchange um, year, I have four years. But um, in Warwick, for example, where I've done my exchange, um, it used to be called law and business and it was a four year degree even without the exchange. So um, you should definitely check that out. I think it varies on universities or um, different, depending on different modules, that, like different, um, the different combinations of the two subjects that you're taking. So for me, it was in my first year, it was um, very business based. We had mostly business modules, um, also like business administration as well as economics. Um, and the law was more of a introductory into law in general. So we did have public and private law, and then also um, a bit of a harder exam of civil law um, to get an insight into that. Um, and um, next to these things, we also had statistics and um, other business modules, um, business related modules. So yeah, first year, very business based. Then second and third year, um, so because of the different system, I'm not going to go into that, but we, we don't have a specific second and third year, it's just all a mix. Um, so yeah, um, in those two years, you focus on mainly law and you only have in my in my university we only had a specialization which is um, a business um, administration um, module but a very big one so it's usually it's um, one subject but five modules um, so that's the only the only business um, thing that we have in the next two years um, and the rest is law so um, it starts with private law um, where you can have civil law um, a, a deeper insight into civil law than competition antitrust and intellectual property law um, and also business and corporate law and i think it's pretty cool that um, in my university we have uh, a lot of smaller subjects which gives you a better insight into many different um, places but you, uh, many different um, areas of, of law um, but you should definitely probably when choosing what you want to study or where you want to study and um, check how the modules are i think in the uk they're usually a bit bigger um so yeah but to me it was interesting especially because in um in most of like continental europe they expect you to do a master's anyway so i thought it was nice to have a broader overview throughout the bachelor's degree and then be able to specialize deeper into the master's um, so yeah, that was private law. Then we also had public law, um, which is mainly constitutional um, law and general uh, administrative law. Um, then we also had the classics of labor and social security law, tax law, criminal law. Um, we also have one elective, but that's not a lot like um, other universities, especially because we already have, because it's already joined with business and law, we have um, very few electives, but I know um, in other, especially if you only do straight law, for example, you have way more opportunities to choose um, your subjects, especially in the second and especially third year. Um, and yeah, the difference also is, uh, I'm not sure how it is at Oxford, actually, maybe Sean or um, Joseph could tell us, but we have a mandatory dissertation um, but also our exams are usually um, case laws, uh, cases, and we have to apply um, the constitutions and the statutes that we've learned onto the cases. So it's a bit more like um, the criminal law example that uh, Sean showed us at the very beginning, where you had a whole, uh, you know, Henry does this and that and what happens then, like a whole story kind of thing. Um, it's a bit more like that and therefore less essay based, so we don't have general essay questions. Um, which is why I think the dissertation is the only thing where um, we actually have to write uh, like as an academic writing and to do all of that uh, more essay based um, um, research so so that's why I think it's mandatory. Um, and yeah so that that's about the that's it about the um, joint honor degree. Um, 
yeah sean how how is it with you um i think in the uk you will have um a mixture of essay and problem questions so okay. usually i think it would be compulsory for you to do at least one essay question and at least one problem question and if you have for example four questions the other two it's up to you That's what you cool. pick i mean that that would depend on and therefore the you also but, don't have a compulsory dissertation right um in oxford we have to do an extended essay on okay. um jurisprudence mm -hmm. i'm not sure if that would be considered a dissertation i mean it's probably i'm not sure about it. How long is it? Do you know how long it is? I know, I have no idea. Okay, yeah. Well, our dissertation is like 30 pages, but an extended essay is maybe similar, so maybe, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, it's interesting to see like how the differences are. And then on the next slide here, as you can see, we have um, different, uh, like different possibilities where you can do a law degree combined with something else. So if you're interested in uh, not just law, if you want to expand it further, you should definitely have a look into what options there are because um, when when Joseph, Sean and I looked through the things, we were actually surprised at how much you can, um, how much you can combine with law. Um, and I think some of the subjects really sound very interesting. Um, and, and yeah, so it's, it's definitely worth having an, an, a look into it. Um, then I'll hand over to Joseph, I think. Oh, uh, um, before we move on, it's important uh, for the UK especially uh, to check if they would be considered qualifying law degrees. Otherwise, you'd have to do a do conversion course. Yeah. yeah. Also, um, what I thought was interesting, maybe interesting to note, um, but we'll go to the um, um, practic practicing law later on anyway, but just beforehand, I'm going to say that um, um, it's not only um, not non-law degrees where you need the GDL, it's also if you do a law degree in another country, like I'm doing, for example, that you need the GDL. But I think it's especially if you guys come from other countries and, and other places, it's definitely worth um, thinking about it. Because for me, for example, if I want to be a lawyer in Austria, I need to have done my bachelor's and master's in Austria, and otherwise it, it would be worthless. Um, if I came with another degree or even with a law degree from the UK, which is why I decided to stay in Austria, actually, um, because in the UK, it's so easy, even though you have a, another degree, you can just do a one year GDL and conversion um, and still practice there. So I think that's definitely worth um, thinking about before before moving and because it's quite a big decision, I think. And in the UK, it's always a bit more flexible. It, it seems more flexible through um, choosing whether you want to like even if you did a non-law degree or in another country you can always still practice which is pretty cool so yeah now i think we can hand over to joseph thank you yeah thanks Eva. so i'll be covering what the application process is like to applying to study law at a university in the uk uh so next slide please uh yeah okay so these are a few important dates that you have to take note of, depending on whether you are going to be applying to Oxford or Cambridge or any other university in the UK, your deadline to be a little bit different. So if you're applying to Oxbridge, you have a earlier deadline of 15 October, while if you're applying to other universities such as UCL, LSE, Kings, for example, Durham, your deadline would be 15th January 2021. And the latest you can submit a UCAS application would be 30th June 2021. However, the 15th January deadline will be what UCAS knows as the equal consideration deadline, which is a deadline that if as long as you submit your application prior to 15th June, universities must compare and evaluate your application uh, on an equal and fair basis with everybody else, even if they submitted their application earlier. However, if you miss the 15th January deadline, you may potentially be at a disadvantage or have to compete for fewer spaces available in the schools you're applying to. Okay, uh, next slide, Sean. Okay, so one of the biggest things that people worry about in their UCAS application is the personal statement. So the UCAS personal statement is a 4,000 character personal statement where you're supposed to write about yourself, especially to show a degree of interest in the, in the subject that you wish to study. So in this case, 
it will be about long. It is really an opportunity for you to demonstrate not only your interest, but also your suitability to studying the subject. And one important thing to take note about the personal statement is that only one personal statement will be used in your UCAS application that will be submitted and disseminated to all five universities you apply for. So in UCAS, you can apply to up to five universities, but you can only submit one personal statement. So it's very important that you do certain things like ensure that you don't specify the name of a university in your personal statement. Okay, Sean, uh, next slide. Okay, so some tips and tricks about how I was able to perform slightly better on my personal statement and some things which I found have been effective for my juniors or other people who have applied to law is firstly on the generic side, as I said, make sure you do not mention a university or college by name because that personal statement will be disseminated to all of your choices and you are not able to change your personal statement after the submission of your application. Secondly, be authentic and original. So this matters for two reasons. Firstly, because every personal statement that is submitted is checked for plagiarism. So if you have copied somebody else's personal statement, that is likely to be flagged by UCAS. And secondly, admission tutors, especially uh, at Oxbridge, LSE, they read thousands of personal statements every admission cycle. And if you're not authentic and if you're not original, it's very easy for your application to simply be glossed over. And lastly, don't make any basic spelling or grammatical errors. If you're at a stage where you are approaching your personal statement and you're not very sure how you should construct it, one very important thing to take note of is that this personal statement is meant to be academic in nature. So aim to have 75 to 80% of your content being academic focused, either how your own personal studies at school, at high school, have been relevant for building your interests and building skill sets relevant to the study of law, or perhaps any other extracurricular activities that you did that sort of helped build you towards this interest in studying law as a subject. For the next 25 uh, to 20% of your personal statement, you can specify things like transferable skills and experiences from your co-curricular activities, from any competitions or books you have read, as well as your hobbies and interests. But always remember to link it back to why you want to study law. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so some law-specific tips is that you must make sure your interest in studying law is clear. So this includes things like your extracurriculars, experiences, so on and so forth. Be able to answer the question, why law? What drew you to law? And how did you nurture your interest in law? Because that demonstrates commitment and that also demonstrates that you have done your due diligence by reading out about the subject. So apart from passion and commitment, you also want to demonstrate relevant competencies that will show admission tutors that you would be a good pick for a law student. So a few examples of some competencies that would be relevant for studying law include things like analytical skills, things like being able to make reasoned and balanced arguments, and for instance, being able to form independent opinions. So one important thing which Sean mentioned earlier as well is that studying law does not equate to becoming a lawyer. So a lot of people make the mistake in their personal statement that they talk on end about why they want to be a lawyer, but don't demonstrate why they want to study law. And that would be a significant problem because in the UK, you don't have to study law to become a lawyer. Okay, next slide. Okay, so for law, chances are you would have to take one of two subject tests. If you're applying to Oxford or most of the other universities in the UK, such as LSE, King's, UCL, and Durham, you'll need to take this admission test called the Law National Aptitude Test, also known as LNET, which constitutes two parts, an MCQ section and an essay-based section. So the MCQ section will be graded out of 42, and your university, the universities you're applying to will receive your grade, as well as a copy of your essay. And based on this, they will make an assessment on whether or not you are a good candidate for them. If you apply to Cambridge, however, you won't need to take the LNET, but you'll need to take another test called the Cambridge Law Test, which is an essay-based exam that is handwritten. So for the LNET, it will be a digital exam. But for the Cambridge Law Test, 
you will be given four essay prompts to complete one essay within 60 minutes. So that's the two different subject tests available for law. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay. So if you apply to Oxbridge, uh, you will have to undergo an interview generally for all the subjects you apply for. And especially for law, the interview is very, very important because it is a significant opportunity for the tutors of your college to understand how you think, to test your approach to difficult problems and things like that. So generally, what the interview strives to do is to simulate the close contact teaching environment available at Oxford and Cambridge. So in Oxford, it will be the tutorial system as Sean mentioned, and for Cambridge, similarly, it will be the supervision system where your classes are really conducted in a one-to-one -one or even one-to-two sort of format where the questions and the teaching is very rigorous. And you want to ensure through the interview that you are a good fit for that sort of teaching methodology and are able to effectively learn through such close contact teaching. If you make it to the interview uh, at Oxbridge, generally they will be handled by the college you applied to. So for example, uh, unless you have been pulled to a different college. So for example, personally at Oxford, even though I applied to Trinity, I was pulled to Wardham. So Wardham College was the one which held my interview. And generally you would have at least two interviews if you fly over, for instance, if you are not locally based to either Oxford or Cambridge to have your interview. So common tasks you can expect at the Oxbridge interview involve things like firstly, a discussion of your personal statement. So for example, if you raise any legal questions or you raise any uh, interesting concepts in your personal statement, your tutor may ask you to explain your position on these things, to ask you to present different perspectives to what you have brought up. Another common type of interview at, at Oxbridge would be a hypothetical based interview. So different forms this can come in are either your tutors give you a hypothetical scenario and ask you questions based on your ability to understand and dissect that hypothetical scenario. Other alternatives include things like giving you a statute, a law or a rule, and asking you to whether or not this rule applies in certain hypothetical situations or not. The third common task which you can expect in an Oxbridge interview is a statute or judgment-based interview. So what this commonly entails would be prior to your interview, you'll be given anywhere between 15 minutes to maybe an hour, depending on the length of the document you have to read. And you could be given, for instance, a case judgment to read through and understand, such that during the interview itself, your tutor will, able to, will be able to have a discussion with you to see how much you are able to understand from the statute and also ask you questions relevant to the statute or the judgment to see whether you are able to really apply and understand the logic behind the decisions judges made or for instance, are you able to apply the logic of the statute that you are given? Okay, uh, so now moving on to the next slide. Some tips for the Oxbridge interview. So one very important thing to take note of, especially for law interviews, is that there may not necessarily be a correct answer. So some applicants become very afraid or very self-conscious about the answers they provide at interviews and are afraid that simply because they give a wrong answer, that that would automatically mean they have failed the interview. But that is, uh, that is not true. So the thing is that your Oxbridge tutors and your interviewers they really want to see how you think. So this brings me to the second point, which is when you respond to questions from the tutor, make sure you think out loud. So what this means is that instead of just sitting in silence and thinking about how to respond and what answer to give to the question, you should instead vocalize your thought process. Say, for instance, oh, based on this XYZ information in the text, I think we should apply certain rules or we should apply certain logic, and it would apply in certain scenarios, for example. And the benefit of thinking out loud, not only does it show the tutor how you think, but it also allows your tutor to identify certain mistakes in your logic and point them out to you such that you can, for instance, change your responses and make the interview more interactive. So the third tip would be don't assert, argue. 
so a lot of times within an interview, some people may answer, oh, uh, it is, the answer is X, but they don't provide legitimate or reasoned logical arguments behind their answer to back up why they think the answer is X, for instance. So always remember that when you are making your answers to make sure you have reasons for them to back it up with evidence, especially if you have, uh, if you are able to draw any form of evidence from the text. And always make sure you have a consistent position as well. Avoid contradicting your own logic if possible. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. While it is important to have a consistent position, the thing is that you must also be aware that your interviewer is more likely to understand the situation better than you do, which means that don't defend your position if it is indefensible. So oftentimes, uh, especially in hypothetical interviews, your, your tutor may help you, give you hints, give you prompts to guide you as, along a certain path, especially if the logic flow you have been following may not have been accurate. So if you are able to identify something that your tutor has pointed out, don't be afraid to backtrack. Instead, acknowledge the things that your tutor has given you and then change your position if necessary. So that would be covering the second point as well. And lastly, one important thing to take away is that the tutors are there to guide you. Uh, unless you're very unlucky, you may encounter a tutor who's there to grill you, but that's not the most common situation at Oxbridge interviews. So if you don't know or don't understand what anything means, feel free to ask them, because if you just guess wildly, chances are it would look a little bit worse than if you simply ask them what they meant. Okay, so now, I'll pass the time back over to Sean. I'll just very briefly talk about um, some careers and opportunities you can expect after um, completing a law degree. Um, so uh, something very important in the UK is that there is a difference between becoming a barrister and a solicitor. And generally the main difference is a barrister, um, the nature of their work is based on advocacy. So that means that they will have access to the higher courts to kind of argue cases um, before judges. Whereas a solicitor does more advisory work. So that means they would, for example, advise on drafting contracts, um, facilitating agreements between um, a shared deal, for example. Um, the qualification process is also going to be different. So for a barrister, you need to take a one-year BPTC after the end of your law degree and then do a one-year pupillage uh, at uh, barrister's chambers. For solicitors, you need to take the um, quali uh, solicitor's qualifying examination. Um, I think this is just coming into effect. Um, this is new. Um, so there is no compulsory um, learning period. It's just an exam. So you can take the exam whenever, but, uh, and then you need to complete two years of training, uh, which is also part of the SQE. Um, so in other countries, like for example, Malaysia, it's a fused profession. So whatever lawyer you are, you're, you could do both. Um, you could be, do work that's both of the nature of the barrister work and the solicitor work. So this is something to keep in mind. And uh, if you're interested in further, further studies, so the most common masters is the LLM. Um, and there's also the Oxford uh, BCL, which is um, a, bit more, a bit tougher, um, a bit more vigorous. Um, so if you want to, if you're thinking about further studies, you could explore these options. So I think we should get started on the Q&A. I'll have it yeah, back please, to please. Joseph. For those of you who joined slightly later and you have, you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom menu to submit questions. So for now, we have two questions. So for the first question, uh, I've heard that which university you apply for in the UK impacts which sort of firms you get to network with. For example, different specialized fields. Is this the case for Oxford? Are there certain fields of law for which Oxford provides an edge in careers? 
maybe Sean, you could share a little bit about what kind of firms have come down to do open days or networking dinners at Oxford? Um, I don't think that um, the uni you go to would really affect what kind of firms um, come and give talks. Uh, if you're proactive enough, you could go to London where most of the firm's offices are and attend whatever talks uh, are going on there. Usually there are more diverse um, talks and uh, networking opportunities in London. Um, in Oxford, there aren't really, I haven't really seen any specific, specifically niche um, networking events. Um, I might be wrong about that. Um, but I think uh, firms are keen to get um, students from every university. I, I can't say for, uh, I can only really speak about, I think, London universities um, and some of the more bigger campus universities besides Oxford. And I think that firms go there as well. There are networking opportunities there as well. So I don't think that's something to be concerned about. I can actually confirm, like in Warwick, there were a lot of networking opportunities and a lot of firms that came. Um, and there I did notice the commercial law um, emphasis a lot, just in case you were, yeah. Yeah, so as, as what Sean and, and Siva have mentioned, even if these firms don't go directly to your university, which I understand most firms do go to Oxbridge, it doesn't necessarily give any particular university an itch in specialization because a lot of these firms hold centralized open days in London where as long as you can apply to the firm to attend these open days, regardless of which university you are in, if you get accepted, you can just attend the event, the networking event uh, in London or in different parts of the UK. Okay, so the second question uh, comes from Tarun. So he says, apologies if this was already mentioned earlier, but could I ask the panelists, what motivated him to join law? It would help you decide if it's something appropriate for you. Okay, uh, so may maybe I'll get the ball rolling on this one before I pass the time to Sean and then to Siva. So personally, for me, my interest and motivation behind why I found law interesting stemmed a lot from my personal interest in international relations in global affairs. So I was sort of a person who from young felt that law was always sort of a path which I potentially considered due to its nature of being advocative in, in nature. And after joining public speaking co-curricular activities like Model UN, for instance, I realized that that sort of advocacy and that sort of analytical approach to conveying a position, to arguing a stance, was something that really consolidated my interest in studying something strongly analytical in nature. And I think of a lot of these subjects, especially within the humanities, which I studied in high school and in secondary school, law was the most obvious choice. And also I think in terms of career opportunities, I felt that law opened a lot of doors for me and that would have opened a lot of doors for me in that sense. So that was what motivated me to join and to study law specifically. So maybe Sean? Uh, I think for me, I didn't really know what I wanted to study at university. I just knew what I didn't want to study. Um, I wasn't so keen on math. So for example, economics wasn't, um, wasn't going to be an option for me. But I did some debating at high school. And I always, I, I always liked essay writing based subjects such as like English and history. But I wasn't too interested in pursuing that at a degree. And um, I've always been passionate about arguing, um, especially for human rights and arguing, protecting the um, interests of minority groups. So I think that would probably was what probably naturally led me to law. But I think, I do believe that law, uh, anyone can find law interesting as long as you are interested in reading and writing essays. That's what I meant. Uh, Siva? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it was 
quite similar, but I wanted to add to Sean's point of knowing what you don't like. I think that is a huge step in deciding what you want to do. Just alone, like being able to rule out a few things, that's super important. So don't underestimate that as well. And like for me, um, I had been, I had like um, lived in different countries and I realized that it wasn't like, I realized that the differences weren't just in the structure of these countries or, um, or you know, um, the different cultures and things like that. But I think the main differences all rule back to the law and how like without, if the jurisdiction doesn't function, then the economy won't function either. That's what I thought. And I thought that was a really important step. Like it was because I thought it would be interesting to understand all of like all the whole um, interconnection between economics and, and law and how the world just functions. And I felt like law is the step before that, even that without the law, you can't even have a functioning or like a functioning economy. You can't have minimum substantial means for the population. And um, it was really like a matter close to my heart because I've been to like refugee camps um, along the Lebanese border and stuff. And when I saw like how how like what kind of inequality you have obviously everyone talks about inequality and law and these things but i just felt like with that it's the step before that and with an economy that, like a functioning economy you can help people out of these um issues and the step before that for me was law so that's what i particularly like thought was interesting about it just having the connection of all of these issues together um but yeah there's a lot of different you know, motivators or driving forces behind what, like why you would want to pursue that. And it doesn't always have to be humanitarian. It could also be that, like, I also thought um, about it logically. I was like, what am I good at? And what do I like doing? And I knew I'm good at arguing and I like um, um, talking to people or I've done like speech competitions in school, at, at school. And I thought that was really something that I did passionately and, um, um, and then I thought like, yeah, in other, in other careers, cause I was, I mean, it's stupid, but at the time I was considering doing like medicine, which is completely different. And I was like, yeah, but at medicine, I can't do that. So I, it's also a different, like you can also evaluate it through knowing what your um, strengths and weaknesses are. I hope that helps. All right. Uh, thanks, Yvonne and Sean. So for the next question uh, from the chat, Leticia asks, is there a validation of the law degree through these universities for those who already have degrees in another country? Uh, so from my understanding, if, if I understand Leticia's question correctly, is that if you already have a law degree in another, in, in another university, for instance, and you can consider applying to the UK to these universities for either your master's or your postgraduate degree, so for example, Sean earlier mentioned that for Oxford, there's the BCL, which is the Bachelor of Civil Law, or there are LLM degrees, which are basically a master's in law in many other universities. Uh, maybe Sean or Siba, if any of you know anything else about whether ex uh, overseas university validation in UK. Um, yeah, I was Googling it throughout the um, panel now, but I didn't really find a specific, like, specifically to your question, but what I know is that, as we've already mentioned, like you can do the GDL and, and still practice law. Um, and also you can do, usually you can do a master's in law without a bachelor degree in law, um, in like, I mean, in UK law. Um, which is also quite helpful, but I'm, I'm not sure about um, whether you can, if that's what you mean, I'm not sure about whether you can um, transfer credits from, from your like foreign law degree to the UK law degree. But to be honest, I doubt it because they're quite strict with the, with the law exams. Um, like you have to have done specific exams that are qualifying in your degree in the UK to be able to count it as a qualifying law degree. So I hope that helps. I think if your purpose is to practice as a lawyer in the UK, then there is no um, need to pursue another law degree in, yeah, um, in the UK. But if it's more of, uh, if you're more interested in kind of academia and um, about debating about 
the UK legal system, then I would think that, that that's the only validation that come to my mind. Um, Thank uh, Yeah, Sean, do you want to share anything? Um, but yeah, they're just like the generic arguments about that it trains your critical thinking um, and your reasoning skills. So if you want to develop those skills further as well, that could be another validation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the next question from another anonymous attendee is, do any of you foresee pursuing an LLM or a BCL in the future? What sort of careers would be opened by pursuing this? So maybe Siva, are you considering any postgraduate studies since you are the closest to graduating? You're stressing me with this question so much. <laughs> um, yes, I definitely am. Um, however, I literally finished my last exam yesterday. So today, like starting from today, I'm going to be able to have a deeper look into what options I have. Um, but um, I'm going to like, I want to pursue a, 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 a like law of masters because out of my interest for academia and because in Austria and I think most of continental Europe without a master's degree or bachelor's degree is useless basically and I can't even qualify with us without a master's degree in Austria so um, I think I have different like purposes why I want to do it but um, in the UK you definitely don't need a master's degree as we've already, as we've already said um, you definitely don't need a master's degree to be able to um, um, practice law. Does that uh, answer the question? Yeah. I would, yeah. I would Sorry, add that um, I think pursuing a master's degree yeah. is more than anything, apart from for academia purposes, is just to set you apart from the crowd. Um, for example, the BCL is especially popular if you want to become a barrister. Chambers really like that. If you go look at any uh, chambers websites, a lot of the barristers tend to have a BCL. Um, so if you aim to become a Queen's Council in the UK, for example, I think it's, you'd almost, you kind of, you definitely need a, at least an LLM, if not a BCL. Um, but in terms yeah. of pursuing a career, it's not necessary but it will definitely improve your um, career prospects. Thanks Sean and Siva. So the next question is what sort of overseas opportunities whether it's exchanges or internships do students get at Oxbridge? So Sean are you familiar if, uh, with, with what Oxford offers in terms of in overseas opportunities? Yeah um, so when you are choosing to apply you could uh, either apply for BA jurisprudence um, at Oxford, or you could apply for the jurisprudence um, with European studies. Uh, and then for that course, you would have to choose um, to do a year abroad in your third year, either in, I think the options are Spain, Italy, France, Germany, if I'm not mistaken, and Amsterdam. Amsterdam. So, um, if you want to do a year abroad, you, at Oxford at least, you have to apply for that course. There might be opportunity to transfer onto the course, the, the just law with European studies um, at the end of first year, but if you are certain you want to do a year abroad, you should definitely apply specifically for that course. But I'm not sure about Cambridge, but I think generally universities have um, a year abroad option. Um, Maybe Siva, you can share a little bit of what your experience was like since you did a year abroad, but in the UK instead. Um, yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed it because I um, have always been interested in UK law and um, because I knew that it's uh, one of the like leading um, types of law or like you know how case law and come like throughout the whole commonwealth and how important it is and especially for like um shipping and and things like that like you need it in every aspect um of commercial law um that was the reason for me why i did it in the uk but um i think it was it's very different like 
in my university, we have over 200 partner universities. You could choose from so many different places and you could choose um, just a year before go actually going. So you didn't have to know it at the beginning. So I think it's, I, I, I'm not sure how much it would help to know about my university because it's so different to Oxbridge, I assume. Yeah, um, Joseph, can you um, go to the next question or is there still more need for clarification on this one? Yeah, maybe his so internet, so. maybe he's not hearing us, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Siva, could let you me go to the next one? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, let me see. Okay, so Sean, for you maybe, um, how big or significant are extracurriculars at Oxbridge? Um, at Oxbridge, it's not significant at all, I would say. I think it's definitely good to have some of it, but Oxbridge, the degree is very, it's, it's very academic based. So I think what your tutors will be looking for is your academic ability. Um, this is not to say that you shouldn't do any extracurricular. Um, of course, that you need some extracurricular to substantiate your interests in law, but your focus of the personal statement um, and your application uh, needs to be, uh, especially for Oxbridge, you need to be strong in your academics, your grades, um, your personal statement, as Joseph explained. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Joseph, I've carried on with the questions because I assume your internet was oh, yeah, yeah, my internet died first. Yeah, but go ahead with the next one. Okay, so for the last question, uh, I've heard that which university you apply for in the UK impacts... Oh, okay, this has been answered already. Uh, actually, Siba, I think I can't view the questions on my side anymore. Would you just like to continue? Yeah, sure. So um, I think one of the most interesting ones, and I've also been asking myself that question, is um, for you guys, Sean and Joseph, why you chose Oxford over Cambridge? Uh, for me, it's more of a, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a petty reason, but <laughs> the offers that they give for Oxford are lower than the offers that they give for Cambridge. So I did, for example, the IB, so we needed 3866 inch, which is basically a AAA at A levels, whereas Cambridge, um, a girl two years above me had a, a 45 offer, which means like a perfect score in the uh, IB. And um, I didn't want to take that risk. So that's why I chose Oxford. But another big thing was um, the town. I preferred the Oxford town a lot more. Um, it was a lot bigger, and I think the colleges as well are a lot bigger. But that would be personal preference, whether you like. Uh, both towns are equally beautiful. Isn't Oxford a bit closer to London as well? Um, I think they're both. The trains take bo about an hour each. Oxford, you get into either Paddington, you get into Paddington Station, which is, I guess, closer to the center of London. Um, whereas Cambridge, you get into Liverpool Street Station, usually. But the difference is negligible, I think. Yeah, for, for me, personally, uh, because I'm, I'm Singaporean, so I have to serve a two-year mandatory national service. So the interesting thing about my application experience is that I actually applied to both Cambridge and Oxford. So in, in 2017, when I graduated, I applied to Oxford. Uh, I mean, I applied to Cambridge, but because I think it was based on my predicted grades and I didn't do very well for my predicted grades, I, I was rejected from Cambridge. So I was thinking, okay, since I have national service, I technically can apply three times because in 2017, 2018, and 2019, because I only go into university in 2020. So in, I decided to apply to Oxford in 2018 such that if I don't get it, I can make an informed decision about what, where I should apply to in 2019. So the funny thing is that I, I applied to Oxford in, in 2018. I, I got it. So, okay, I guess. But uh, some ideas about the differences between Oxford and Cambridge that um, I considered when I was choosing between them included things such as the examination system. So I think as Sean mentioned earlier in the webinar, 
for Oxford, the exam system works with moderations in the end of the second term. And then we have this thing called final honors school, which is basically all of Oxford law exams plugged in like the last month of your university studies. And uh, how well you do, your entire like honor grade you are given depends on your performance in, in those exams. So I do have friends who chose to apply to Oxford, uh, to Cambridge over Oxford because they didn't want to handle that stress. Because if I understand correctly, the Cambridge system is slightly more on the continuous assessment sort of method, where instead of leaving everything to the end of it, yeah. And other things that people considered are, for instance, as, as Sean mentioned, the size of the, of the place. So uh, Cambridge is slightly smaller. It's a little bit more quaint, while Oxford is a little bit of a larger town. So there's more places to walk around. It's a little bit uh, the more buildings and more space in that sense. So if you prefer that smaller, quaint environment, then you may prefer Cambridge over Oxford. But uh, it is, to a large degree, personal preference. Yeah. I would add the Cambridge Law Library is much nicer. So if you're a person who likes to work in the library. These are very good. important things, by the way. <laughs> you're spending a lot of time there. <laughs> um, something else I would add is that from what I've, what I, what my, at least my friend at Cambridge, uh, what he experiences is that they only have um, one essay per module every two weeks. So if you do the math, it comes up to less essays than we do at Oxford, uh, Oxford a term. So at Oxford, you do about 12 essays a term, whereas in Cambridge, I think you do about 10 essays, if I'm not mistaken. And something else, um, is that there are a lot more options um, uh, at Cambridge. Uh, in Oxford, you only have, you only get to choose two options. Whereas um, in Cambridge, most of your second year and third year will be chosen by you. So that's something you should consider as well. Thank you. Um, Joseph, how much time do we have left? Because I think we're already, just because we still have a few open questions. Okay, uh, we have three more minutes, so I think we can take one to two more questions. Yeah. Okay, so we have one about law and psychology and their combination. As I do business law, I'm not sure I could answer that. Do you guys have any ideas or should we maybe email or something privately later? Yeah, so I, I think uh, none of the three of us have are doing a law and psychology degree, so we may not be the most qualified to respond to this. Uh, However, if you're interested in applying, we, what we would recommend you do is to also consider applying for the Project Access Mentorship Program. Because if you are accepted into the mentorship program, it is likely that you'll be paired with somebody who can potentially, for instance, is studying law and psychology, who would be far better uh, able to help you on this. Yeah, so I'm not so sure if Sean knows anybody studying law and psych, but yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> what is the question? Uh, um, yeah, so I am tr I am trying to decide whether to study law or psychology. I know, like you mentioned earlier, that law and psych can be combined at law school. Do you know how those two studies are combined if you study law and psychology? Yeah. So do you know anyone who does a double honors or double degree? No, I don't know anyone who does law and psychology. Yeah. Sorry about that, Emma. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, and then maybe one or two last ones. Um, so one question is, why are the cases so long? Do you mean, um, like, do you mean the exam questions in the case, like these cases? Okay, she can't, they can't answer, right? Okay, if that is the case, so we have like um, three hour examinations and like one really long um, case, and then you have to um, like part, like put, put the parts apart and, and do the case. Um, I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense, but it, it's not, do, in Oxford, you don't have um, cases, right? Uh, well, we call them problem questions. And the one I, the example I put was actually a short version. Mm -hmm. So usually they'd be longer. At Cambridge, they're, they're much longer than the Oxford ones. Maybe another reason to consider applying to Oxford. But um, they're long because, um, there are often many different contentious issues that you have to apply different areas of the law. Um, so 
answering those questions, your focus is you focus quite a bit on the passage, um, which is why they tend to be longer. Um, but they're also very interesting. I prefer them over essays. Yeah. But if you're talking about the case judgments, uh, as in like case law, then oh, I think that's just, that's, what they meant. <laughs> that's just that's uh, just problem with the judges in the, in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think Dubai, you can take one last question and then we'll wrap up for today. Uh, sorry, what, one last question you said? Yeah, so we can take one last question okay. and then we'll So um, one for probably Sean would be the best suited um, to answer is that because that, um, someone was asking what alternative career paths you could like are supported in, or did we answer that one at Oxford? Um, so if you don't want to be a solicitor or barrister? Um, I think it would very much depend on you and how proactive you are, if you're interested in any other, like there are always talks at Oxford. So it's just up to you to find them out and attend the talks and discover what other um, paths there are open. But in terms of support and in terms of um, resources, I think it's endless at Oxford. So it's, it's really as much as it's really up to you to discover for yourself. But um, there's plenty, for example, a very popular thing to do is to go into consulting or banking. Um, yeah, so. There's also society the options are limitless. and other yeah. opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Joseph, should we maybe answer one last one? Because I think that's a quick one and you would be able to answer it. So whether sure. the personal statement has to have a flow or ordering of ideas? There's no specific like flow in a sense. Uh, I think there's no real prescribed flow, but I think what is important when you write your personal statement is when you read it yourself, whether you are able to, do you feel that the flow of your essay is clear and conveys the message and your interest well? I think the most common flow in a sense would always be starting with what drew you to law, followed by how you develop your interest in law uh, in terms of extracurricular activities or readings. And then lastly, relevant skill sets. So just remember to focus the bulk majority of your personal statement on the academic aspects, which make you a good candidate to study law as a subject. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in that case, I think we will be ending here for tonight's webinar. So thank you very much for all of you who have attended tonight's webinar. If you are considering applying to Project Access to be your mentee, please feel free to do so. The Project Access Mentorship Program is a very, very rigorous uh, pro program where the mentor will be specifically tied to you to help you through your application path much better than what we can do in this one hour, 15 minutes of this webinar. So do check it out at our website at projectaccess.org and we hope to see you there. Thank you. Bye. Bye.